طبعا هذا الاطول انه ترسل له هذا الحشو الدافع طلع سرت اشتعاله الله أكبر 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 In this very short video clip, we get a, just a small sense of the complexity of the situation in Syria. And not just complexity in the idea that there's multiple actors that are involved in the situation, but complexity in the sense that not only are there actors, but there's systems within which those actors operate. And then those systems integrate with each other in ways that we can often see and not see. In that situation, we saw how there were Syrian rebels that are engaging with other Syrian rebels in different groups with different ideologies. And at the same time, they're using things like technologies like gun cotton, which is technology that had been around since the late 1800s, but has been out of use for the most part. And so certain economic conditions in this, in this war uh, created the situation where now that, the use of that technology had to come to the fore again so that they could uh, proper some military might in ways that they wanted to. And it also happened through the use of things like social media that the rebels were able to use to be able to, to gather information and to be able to come together to use technology like that. So in all those situations, we see that there are multiple things working together, multiple open systems that all come together to form a, the reality of, of the situation on the ground, which is often much more highly complex and much more interrelated than we make it out to be. This morning we're going to talk about four main areas of uh, analysis for the Syrian conflict. I'm trying to look at it not from a, a, a binary perspective of having uh, either a regime and the opposition, but looking at it more of a complex causality. We'll look at some systems that are at play, an overview of those systems. Then we'll start talking about some causal stories, looking at things like ideology, things like institutional causes, psychological causes, and, inf and uh, structural causes. Then we'll look at how those different systems integrate to be able to form the reality of what's going on on the ground. Not by reduce, and as we look at it, we're not going to reduce the complexity to the point where we can't say what's really going on, but we're going to try to look at the, at the complex situation and try to come up with theories and come up with frameworks of how to be able to understand and integrate with the complexity of that environment. And then we're going to go back and look at some experimental action where we potentially, um, as strategists, could have in the past intervened in ways that would have been meaningful given the complexity of the situation. So when we look at the Syrian civil war, this is a way that a lot of, uh, of policymakers have typically looked at it. We have the Assad regime, and we have the opposition. And in between them, we have a master cleavage, a, a conflict that's going on between them. And we often reduce the conflict, or often reduce the situation, into this master cleavage. But we start to realize soon that as we do that, if we reduce it just to that master cleavage, we start to lose some of the interior elements within that. We lose things like the multiple actors that are within the Assad regime. We lose the multiple actors that are as part of the, uh, the opposition, the Free Syrian Army, the Al-Nusra Front, the Islamic Front, the IRGC. And then as we start to realize that there are not only just individual actors within those two master groups, but then there's also other systems, other open systems that are at play that each of these individual actors interact with. And realize that even this is a little is a pretty reductionist in the fact that there's a lot of in, there's a lot of relationships that we're not picturing here. In this case, you have things like violence that the Al Nusra Front uses violence to be able to support some of their cause. You have things like terrain that the regime uses that the opposition uses to their advantage or disadvantage. You have power that's at play, especially as it comes uh, as it relates to the Assad regime and technology that both of these groups are using. 
And, and ideas like social media, which we need to consider all these different facets because they all relate to each other. And at the same time, as we realize these systems are at play, these systems are also at flux. So this is one snapshot in time, but this snapshot doesn't give us the perspective that these are all moving. They're all variations on their influence between, uh, between each one of these groups. But as we continue to dig down into the situation, we realize that there are also some things at play, such as economic pressures between the regime and between the opposition, between things like subsistence, between things like population, the IEPs, the refugees that are involved in this conflict that are playing at, the, at uh, each one of these actors, that are influencing each one of these actors. And then we start to think of things like, well, it's not just structural what's going on. There are some ideational causes behind this conflict as well. There are spiritual ideations, uh, whether it's is Shia or Sunni Islam, Alawites, extremism, that's going to influence each one of these groups, whether it's the Assad regime or the opposition. And it's also things like political ideation, whether it's the non-Baathist opposition or the Baathist Assad regime, and the fact that they're influenced by other things, such as socialism and free markets and the Arab Spring. And so as we try to come up with causality for this conflict, and we try to understand how can we influence this conflict, we start to see that if we try to just target one of these areas, like just targeting one group, or just targeting one aspect, such as the Shia Islam, we start to realize that our action upon just one of these groups is, is going to potentially have a myriad of other effects that we don't realize within all these other, all these other systems. And as we continue to complicate the situation, we realize that there are external actors that have a very powerful influence on what's going on. Things like the U.S., the U.N., Israel, the UAE, Turkey, and especially with the Assad regime, we have actors like Russia and Iran who are going to be influencing the decisions that these groups are making and are going to be providing pressure that, tr that really does complicate the situation as we try to decide how we're going to act. And then even within this now, within uh, this complicated system, we realize that there are other ideologies and there are other psychological causes at play. There are things like rebel spoilers. So as we try to generate a coalition within the rebels, or as the rebels try to generate a coalition and try to come up to, with something like a negotiated settlement, we realize that there are certain rebel groups that actually don't want to negotiate a settlement. They would like for the conflict to continue because their ends, their goals, are different than the rest of the opposition. We have differences in the ability to enforce agreements between the opposition and the Assad regime. And so as we put all these different systems together and realize, that, again, that they're in flux, we start to realize that it is extremely difficult for us to say that we're going to take one action and it's going to have this effect. And so without reducing the complexity of this, this system, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about how we can understand the complexity of this system and then how we can potentially take action in a meaningful way that doesn't reduce that complexity. Stoney. Okay. Okay, so as a basis to map the arguments of the causal stories of Syria. We used the project on Middle East political sciences, the political science of the Syrian war, to inform a framework articulated by Craig Parsons in his book, How to Map Arguments in Political Science. So what we had to do was we told the IBDB causal, sto causal stories um, that gave clarity to a very complex uh, series of relationships. Now these causal stories actually were advanced by about 18 different scholars. And so you can imagine the uh, varying narratives that those scholars may have uh, claimed in their scholarly work throughout uh, this document. So what we did instead was we decided to condense uh, the framework into two central dependent variable outcomes. And those two dependent variable outcomes were, one, the duration of the war, and two, a negotiated settlement. Holistically speaking, we're talking about either a shorter war or a longer war. And for as far as negotiated settlement is concerned, we're talking about positive effects of a negotiated settlement, which might be a lasting peace, or negative effects of a negotiated settlement, meaning you can't come to a negotiated settlement, or it's uh, not one that either actor can trust the other to uh, follow through with. So as an example, what we determined is that the uh, dependent variables, shorter wars, were impacted by myriad independent variables to include unified opposition, less veto players, and U.S. military action. That is to say that when an opposition is unified instead of fragmented, 
that they are much more likely to have a shorter war, and that's directly related to how well they're able to come to a negotiated settlement. The reason there is because a fragmented opposition would yield a longer war. And the explanation, in a very condensed, uh, sloganeering fashion, is really that if you have multiple groups within your opposition, they can't necessarily come to a disagreement, or excuse me, can't come to an agreement. In addition to that, um, one group may not have the authority to speak for another group. And that really gets us into the pluses and minuses of negotiated settlements. As far as that's concerned, a veto player is an actor that comes to the table that can veto the talks. So let's say whether it's someone from the regime or the opposition, those are certainly veto players because they have a, uh, a hand in the fight. However, Russia or the United States or even Iran could be considered a veto player if they're providing some form of aid to either the regime or the opposition, and then they don't like the outcome of the negotiated settlement. So if you have more veto players, that uh, is actually detrimental to a negotiated settlement. I know it's got a uh, twist here, but, um, another, but that was uh, kind of the nature of the document, is that you had many different scholars coming to opposing viewpoints. And another example of that might be third-party arbiter versus U U.S. military action. While one author, say Stanley, for example, suggested that U.S. military action immediately and decisively could uh, help yield a shorter war, another uh, author determined that it actually was detrimental to a negotiated settlement. A reason might be to explain that is that if U.S. military action is incumbent upon, no matter what, the regime is... Uh, having a turnover, a change, a change in the guard, um, Assad can no longer stay in power. Well, what uh, incentive does Assad have to come to the table for a negotiated settlement if the U.S. military action dictates that he's going to have to give over a regime? Well, that's, that's why it can be a negative effect. So just to give a couple of the causal stories, what we did is we determined, just by way of example, causal logic for three specific elements within these two dependent variables. Those three are the fragmented opposition, foreign intervention, and negotiated settlement. So to give you an example of institutional uh, causal logic for why a fragmented opposition might determine an outcome to create a longer war, is that the, uh, as he determined on page 36, the structure of the pre-war political network, so anything from education to political parties, uh, influences the structure of the armed groups. The reason that that's an institutional causal logic is because that's an unintended outcome where the pre-war political networks influence the wartime opposition fragments. A structural explanation behind how foreign intervention might create a longer war, as we uh, alluded to earlier, is that foreign fighters are going to come to Syria simply because they, ha they can. Heghammer... Uh, really elucidates this point when he just explains why that is. First of all, it's easy to get there. Second, there's no punishment for going, so there's impl implicit support of the opposition. And third, rebels, in many cases, control the borders, thus allowing foreign fighters into Syria to help aid the opposition. Again, foreign intervention in that regard leads to a longer war. And finally, negotiated settlement, how it can lead to a longer war. We'll give another uh, structural example as highlighted by Cunningham on page 34. Negotiations with fragmented oppositions typically fail to end the conflict. Again, this is because they lack the credibility to deliver their part of the bargain. They don't have authority to speak for other factions. And third, the states sometimes, so in this case the Assad regime, will actually offer concessions just to be able to reveal additional information about the opposition but also to appeal to moderates. Because if, in fact, then he is appealing to moderates, he is isolating and further fragmenting the opposition in his favor to become a negotiated settlement. It may not have a long-term effect, but keeps him in power. I'll be followed by Major Gallant. Okay, so what I'm going to do for this part of the presentation is to try to describe all these multitude of systems that were first presented at the beginning of our presentation interact with one another uh, t to create what we currently see in the environment. So this is a simplification of what the environment currently looks like. And we know that there's a civil war that's being fought in Syria. It's being fought between the regime on one side and the opposition on the other side. 
And as we think about the way in which these systems interact with one another, uh, different systems and different effects will lead more towards the possibility of a regime victory versus other system interactions leading towards the possibility of an opposition victory. And we'll also consider the likelihood of a negotiated settlement possibly occurring. So initially what we see is that for the opposition to have any hope of succeeding, they need to be able to prevent themselves, present themselves as a viable alternative to the Syrian regime. So the way they do this is they try to find success on the battlefield, they try to seize uh, pieces of terrain, and they attempt to provide services to the Syrian people. This is the only way in which they can present themselves as a le legitimate opposition. So they, they attempt to do this. Immediately, though, what we see in the system is feedback occurring. And this feedback that we see is negative feedback in the sense that when the system moves in one direction, there's a countervailing force that pushes back in the other direction. So in this case, as the opposition seeks to provide services and stability to the people, the regime counters this by doing things such as aerial bombardment, by denying humanitarian assistance in a certain uh, portions of Syria, um, by uh, striking uh, or, or, or cording off villages and not letting people in or out. So they, they do this, and this is all in an attempt to undermine the opposition to show that they really can't uh, be presented as a viable alternative to the regime. So, that, so they do this, and we immediately see this feedback occurring. Now, one of the authors that we study, Kali Voss, um, has done research to show that these type of attacks that the regime is, is using to respond to the opposition, things like aerial bombardment, is more likely to lead to success for the opposition because as the civilians on the ground see these types of things occurring, many of them become casualties as a result of this indiscriminate attack, um, they, they tend to lean more towards the opposition. So that possibly could favor, favor the opposition. Um, ad additionally, what we see as a result of this is that now the opposition is going to increase the att their attacks on the regime because now they've been undermined by these regime attacks. So they're gonna, once again, increase their, their actions toward the regime. So this is a continual cycle that we, that we see occurring. And it can be argued, if we consider the nature of the fighting in Syria right now, that possibly this looks more like a conventional war than an ir irregular war. And the justification for that is that we see a lot of the fighting happening in urban areas. We see a lot of the fighting occurring um, in uh, pitch-type battles where we know where the opposition is, we know the re where the regime is. If we look at Syria, we know the certain parts of the country that are held by either the opposition or the regime. And as a result of this, uh, it's can, it can be claimed to be more uh, similar to conventional fighting, unlike an irregular type of war where you have a lot of fighting in jungle terrain, mountainous terrain, you don't really know who's in charge or who, who's in control of certain areas. So we see that occurring. And if this, in fact, is true, what uh, some of the research that we've studied has shown is that these, this, this type of fighting is more likely to re lead to a shorter war, um, and it's going to be much more intense than a regular war, and much less likely to end in regime victory. So once again, we see forces pushing the, the tide towards the opposition. But of course, this is only a very small portion uh, of the environment, because when we talk about the opposition, we should then ask ourselves, well, who exactly is the opposition? And from what we understand, the opposition is consisted of a multitude of different groups that interact with one another. Um, they're not united very well, they're very disparate, and they don't really coordinate in conjunction with one another. And Paul Staniland refers to this type of organization as a parochial organization. And what he means by parochial is that the groups are, are made up of powerful local factions, but they lack the ability to unite um, as a whole. And as a result of this, we see a number of what we call spoilers, which act as energetic remainders within the system that are pushing the system uh, in different ways than the system as a whole is trying to go. So you have spoilers that come in that are involved in the fighting, that contribute to it enough to keep the opposition moving forward, but their true uh, aims are not to end the war. In fact, they just want to continue to perpetuate the fighting. So spoilers makes it very difficult for the opposition to, to unite together. So the question then remains, what is the likelihood that we see the opposition forces self-organizing? And when we think of self-organization, what we're referring to is the possibility for order to emerge within the system in the absence of some designated leader, which they currently do not have. So it seems very unlikely 
that we'll see self-organization in the sense that the opposition will unite together because of the parochial structure in which uh, the opposition is, is designed around. Now, again, there are still other elements that we need to consider. So, in this case, we have a multitude of external actors that have certain stakes in the fighting in Syria, and they become involved uh, to different degrees to try to affect the outcome of the fighting. Now, the external support to the opposition from the research that we've studied tells us that because the opposition is not very united, all the external support in terms of resources, manpower, etc., information that comes in, is not coming through one central point. In fact, it's going to individual fragments within the opposition. And the difficulty this presents for the opposition is that because the support is coming in to different, different portions of the opposition, they're unable to use these resources efficiently, and they're un unable to coordinate amongst one another. And as a result, each of these individual fragments within the opposition now becomes more responsive to the external actors who have their own interests and preferences than they do to the opposition as a whole. So the external support here makes it very difficult. On the other hand, the regime has external support as well, and they have an advantage in the sense that all their external support is being funneled in through one particular point. This allows the, re the regime to be much more efficient in its use of external resources, because really there's just one body that's governing the use of those resources. So we see an advantage towards, towards the regime in that sense. Uh, overall, though, it's unlikely for external support to really make a difference in this war. In fact, it's, there's enough external support to keep the war raging. There's enough external support on the side of the opposition to allow them to continue fighting, but not enough for them to decisively tip the, tip the scale. And as an unintended consequence of what some have argued are, are half-measured, uh, efforts to support the opposition. In fact, all they've really done is they haven't given them a viable uh, opportunity to be successful on the battlefield. What they really have done is prolong the fighting in such a way to where now there's a much greater probability of extremist organizations infiltrating the opposition, and it will lead to a rise, rise in extremism. We also see an interesting dynamic within the opposition with respect to how well they coordinate and they work with one another, depending on the levels of success they see. So if the opposition becomes, uh, has some su success on the battlefield and they see themselves as likely to be victorious, we're going to start to see more infighting amongst the opposition because now they become more concerned with their future after the fighting's over. Versus times where the regime is very dominant, now the opposition is just fighting to survive, and as a result, they're willing to, to work uh, closer together in order to achieve their aims. So the final thing that we're going to consider with respect to all these systems interacting is whether or not there's a possibility for a negotiated settlement to occur. And the first thing that we should question is, is it even possible that there is a negotiation settle negotiated settlement that both sides will agree upon? And we'll argue yes, there is, because even if you're Assad and you may give up a little bit of power, that could possibly be desirable uh, versus the, the um, chance of having to go to war and the very costly act of fighting a war. So it is possible that there is, is a negotiated settlement that Assad would agree to, and the same with the opposition. The problem that we see, though, is that there's this commitment problem that occurs on both the side of the regime and the opposition that is very likely to prevent a negotiated settlement from ever occurring. So the explanation of the commitment problem is that if you are, the, if you are Assad, and perhaps there's a negotiated settlement that you would agree to, there's only a couple people that are at the negotiating table with you. And you understand that this opposition is very fragmented. So there's really no way that you can believe that whoever's representing you at the, representing the opposition at the negotiation is actually speaking on behalf of the entire opposition. So even if they make some sort of agreement or concessions, there's no reason to believe that the entire opposition is going to abide by that. On the other hand, if you're the opposition and Assad uh, decides to make some concessions towards you, you know that as soon as you disarm and as soon as the fighters disband, there's really no incentive anymore for Assad to keep his promises. So it's very likely that he'll renege on any agreement that he's already made. And as a result, the opposition will not, will not uh, claim, will not wish for anything less than a complete uh, regime uh, changeover. 
Furthermore, we have all these external actors that we're considering. And these external actors uh, act as veto players. And they're veto players because even if the regime and the opposition want to come to some agreement, they all have their own preferences and their own interests and their own uh, stakes here. So they can essentially veto the negotiation by taking some sort of action that just prolongs the conflict. So this, again, makes it much more difficult for a negotiated settlement to occur. Again, these are energetic managers, as we call them, working within the system that's pushing the system in different directions from the way it's moving as a whole. So as a result, we see we have a multitude of systems interacting. We have a very highly fragmented opposition. We have the presence of spoilers, uh, the presence of veto players, all these foreign actors that are intervening just enough to keep the conflict raging, but not enough to decisively end the war. So as a result, we see the current stalemate um, that exists. So, one of the things I'd like to highlight uh, in Major Glonick's presentation here, we've got this excellently detailed elaboration of all the different actors in this open system uh, that have led us to our current state of affairs. Uh, but, but each of these actors is operating on its own tier of what Conway refers to as common time. Uh, and if we look back through the recent history of Syria, of the region, of our involvement of, in the region, and of all these other actors that are involved in the region, we have to consider that over a period of time, some actors have disappeared, other actors have emerged, and each of these actors took a different path to reach this current state. Uh, this is important for informing how we think about experimental action, uh, both currently and down the, the past timeline of our involvement in the region. Uh, we also you know, want to underwrite our thinking of experimental action with uh, Connolly's concept of engagement between these actors over, over the chrono time that each of them experiences in a way that produces new risks, new opportunities, and new potentials in the environment. Now, uh, we want to treat today, uh, we're going to talk about experimental action, but rather than looking at the current point in time, we're going to roll the clock back and look at what experimental actions could have been taken throughout the different uh, paths that brought us to our current state of affairs. What we see here today, uh, across the bottom of our slide, we present a timeline uh, which essentially shows the strengths and weaknesses of the U.S.-Syrian relationship uh, through our recent history. Now, part of our thinking is based on the contingency of the current environment, that what has emerged could have been otherwise, and what will emerge tomorrow may not necessarily be easily predictable. Uh, what we do know is that throughout our history with Syria, we have had periods of strength, uh, of strong diplomatic ties, intergovernmental ties, and we've had absences. The absences denoted by the black areas, uh, there's one at the beginning of the timeline, but there's one here at the end of the timeline, uh, which essentially resulted from WikiLeaks revelations that during the second Bush administration, we might have uh, you know, contributed to opposition groups, uh, despite the fact that our regimes were cooperating to a degree during the war on terror. Now, this removes some of the leverage, uh, some of the influence that the United States might have been able to have on the current civil war in Syria. The civil war has been going on for nearly three years now. Uh, and as Major Clark pointed out, we have some current potentialities which uh, essentially boil down to uh, a negotiated settlement or regime change or a status quo in bellum. All three of those have some very difficult uh, resolutions if, you know, if that is what's going to come to pass. Um, the length of the Civil War has produced some three, of, three effects that complicate any potential resolution. It's the fractionalization of all the opposition parties uh, and whether or not they would be able to come to terms with each other should they assume power of, of uh, the Syrian government. It's Assad's authoritarian consolidation, which has enabled him to maintain his position of power and control over a significant part of the population of the nation. And it's also the increasing influence of third-party actors, uh, all of which have driven the parties to negotiations, which right now are, are a bit of a stalemate. But if we roll back the clock, we see that during the 1990s, essentially during the Clinton administration and up until the early years of the war on terror, we enjoyed 
a healthy relationship with the Assad regime, the prior Assad regime. And what we suggest is that uh, you know, we're going to consider four different interventions that we might have supported along the timeline of U.S.-Syria relations. Uh, is that we might have taken part in a form of enduring engagement, positive engagement, not only with the Assad regime during that time frame, but creating a broader community of interest uh, to help stabilize the Middle East uh, that would have led to a different path today. We also consider that in the early 2000s, uh, because of the aid efforts that we were uh, providing to Syria and, and to its people and to its government at the time, there was an opportunity to essentially create a counter-constituency, uh, an agent of change within Syrian society itself that might have led to a different uh, outcome today. When we consider the onset of the Arab Spring, uh, as it spread across North Africa and into Southwest Asia, there was another opportunity for uh, constructive engagement or for an experimental action in which we could have helped to support nonviolent change uh, rather than the uh, civil war that has emerged since. And then lastly, we will consider uh, how we might have actually supported the regime change through militant action um, that, uh, as Stanley uh, was cited earlier, might have truncated and led to better resolution of the current conflict. So if we go back to the early days of the 1990s, conditions were right for an ever-growing uh, U.S.-Syrian uh, um, positive relationship. We had the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the reduction of Syria's status as a Soviet client state, uh, warming relationships between Hafez al-Assad and, and President Clinton at the time. There was ample opportunity to bring Syria within the U.S. sphere of influence in a, in a very positive way. But that in and of itself was not a sufficient relationship. And, and what really was, uh, could have been beneficial at this point was the cultivation of atypical relationships, things that might not necessarily have been uh, appreciated under U.S. policy at the time or its preceding pol uh, policies. And what I'm talking about here is creating a community of interest among uh, a number, a broad number of nations and actors who all had a significant interest in the stability of Southwest Asia. Uh, so, you know, we had uh, a long-term impasse with the state of Iran. There was a long-term impasse, continuing impasse between the states of Iran and Saudi Arabia. But when the stability of, of the region is of primary importance to everybody at the time, uh, then might we have created this community of interest among nations uh, by, by observing what Connolly calls the conceit of, uh, conceit of structural theory, in which he says, uh, we have, structural theory gives us this initial notion of how resistant to change a system is going to be that in turn might make us more reluctant to try unexpected interventions. Um, but again, you know, had we created a community of interest that was more broadly inclusive at the time, I suggest that uh, it certainly would have provided greater influence over the current state of affairs. I'll be followed by Major Pajak. Okay, so for the first intervention, I'm going to address the causal claim of fragmentation. So all of the theorists said that fragmenta fragmentation is going to contribute to a longer conflict, and it's a positive mechanism. The more fragmentation you have, the longer the conflict. The longer the conflict, the more fragmentation occurs. So the intervention... The intervention is um, a socio-political collective action. So what, what, what you do is during, one slide, sorry. During, during the Iraq war, right before, um, you go to Assad, regime, and you say, listen Assad, you know, we're, we're about to go into Iraq, and there are, there's going to be cross-border, there's going to be groups that are going to try to go into your country, they're going to try to manipulate your country, they're going to try to use your country. And this is the point, after we've already developed those long-term relationships and kept those lines of communication open, as Steve talked about earlier, we go in and we say, we want to help you 
make sure that your society, the whole of the country, can build up that resiliency to reduce that interference from all of those other actors that are going to happen when that instability occurs in Iraq as we go to war. An appeal to Assad um, to allow, allow us to come in, which would be really international organizations, not just the U.S. But what those are, are there's, there's lots of organizations that work on civil society organization and technical advisors to the government that support them on how to do your how do you do a more? How do you become a more tolerant and inclusive um, government that allows for political action in those groups that you're already um, kind of marginalizing? Um, because historically, um, you know, you like to look at Syria and say, okay, there's a lot of fragmentation that's that's going on and it's accelerating, which is true. But the country was already highly fragmented before, which is why you see a lot of the heavy-handedness that you've seen in the Assad regime prior to that. So this is, but this allows the civil society organizations um, to help work with them to become greater political actors. And the objective there is to allow for time, over time, for peaceful change to occur. While working in the existing system, how to make those gains, how to figure out what your narrative is going to be um, be between all the opposing groups, as opposed to what we we have now. Um, The uh, some of the. The benefits to that is is um, it's slow. I mean, we're talking about during the Iraq War, so you've got lots of time for those groups to organize, to communicate, to work together, figure it out what it is that their objectives are going to be. Um, two, it's inexpensive. It's not a large mass military movement. It doesn't cost a lot of money because you're just working about people figuring out how to work within their political system. Um, and then three. Um, it allows for their own self-structuring. So it's not a, we're going to, we want you to act in this way. We want you to, to push forward these political objectives or policies. It allows for them to figure out how they want to self-organize, what power structures they want to see exist, what institutions and what ideas. So that's the first, that's the first intervention. Um, the next one is, sorry, um, this one is um, it's, it's a novel concept. Um, the causal claim that we're trying to address here is the issue of commitment. So all, not every theorist that we looked at um, agreed that the commitment issue about having all the spoilers, the veto players, and all, all the other groups and the government agreeing um, that the issue of that they would all agree to some sort of a negotiated agreement or power structure. They didn't all agree that that would be an issue and that a third party um, would be the best solution for that. But several of them did say that over looking at conflicts that have happened over time, that the third party um, involvement was actually um, the, the, the impetus for, making change, for, for bringing about change in the future. In this case, the most likely third party um, would be Russia. And the goal would be to be a reform obser- to form a reform observation group, much like uh, for voting. Who would have thought years and years ago that a sovereign nation would ever allow another country to come in to observe their elections? It was it was practically unheard of, and even today it seems in fact um, unbelievable that. Sovereign nations who are as strict as they are allow that, them to come in, but it does happen, and that's the same. That's the same theory here. Um, when would you do this? Um, at the onset, here at the onset of the Arab Spring, that's when you really would have we would have needed to come in and start talking about okay, um, talking to these countries that that would have been likely to have this Arab Spring Revolution ideas spread to their countries and start talking to them that, like, how are you going to prepare for this if this comes to your country? What are you going to do about it? Then, after the very first protest, um, that's when the, that, um, observ- the reform observation group, that's when they would need to deploy. And the purpose of that is, one, is it allows the, the Assad regime to remain that tough exterior. The only thing that they're conceding to is that they're going to commit to a peaceful process of communication. And two, it forces the opposition group to work together. You can't come to the table if you don't know what you're going to say. Um, three, and both sides, um, both sides of, of, of this are seen as being a formidable actor. If I'm the Assad regime and I allowed a third-party reform group to come in, 
to help through the to um, to be there during you know how are we going to negotiate what political economic reforms are we going to make what policy concessions are we going to make or not make if I allow a third group to come in it says to that opposition it says to them I see that you are a formidable actor and if I'm the opposition it said if if I see my government say to this third party actor to come in it says to them I know that you have serious concerns and I'm acknowledging that they're there. Not that I'm going to concede anything to you, but I, I do recognize you as a formidable actor, which helps with the commitment issue. And then I will be followed by Steve with the uh, last intervention. So the three thought problems that we've introduced so far, which, which look at experimental action, have all focused on altering the path of events that got us to civil war. Uh, the last one that we're going to consider is what if the path progressed as it already has to the point where the Assad regime uh, begins attacking protesters and it erupts into a civil war that's, that's gone on now for, uh, for nearly three years. Uh, so we have to consider the military options that the U.S. could have supported at very, various points, um, but primarily within the earliest days of the conflict. Uh, so we've reached a point where the Assad regime is conducting violent reprisals and attacks against its own population in response to the protests that have arisen from the Arab Spring. One of the options uh, that should be considered would be surgical strikes or air strikes that are born of the doctrine of right to protect. In other words, the regime uh, of Assad is no longer exercising its obligation to its own people. Uh, and so we therefore would go in uh, and execute activities designed to protect the population of Syria from its own government. Not necessarily oriented on regime change, and what we saw is when this uh, policy was debated in the U.S. government last year, it was seen uh, as, a, as a feeble, uh, you know, ineffective approach to the problems of the time. That was 2013. Uh, it would be interesting to see what effects that would have had on Assad regime action in 2011 uh, when they began the activity. Another approach is more focused on regime change options. Uh, that was a stated policy of our government at one point, and there were, were activities uh, well before that which suggest that, that we might have had interest in regime change uh, for some time. What's important here is uh, you know, some notions that our authors on Syria have, have identified, and, and Stan Lanigan was, was cited earlier, um, about the necessity to progress uh, opposition groups to the capability for con conventional war, in other words, war on parity with the regime, uh, in order to bring about a rapid conclusion that is favorable to the opposition group. Uh, and this really would have required a lengthy preparation uh, of, of partner forces and of populations by various U.S. government efforts. Uh, in other words, partner forces would have had to be ready to move from the initial stages of insurgency to uh, a more open fight with full support by, by external forces uh, in the earliest days of the war in order for it not to have gotten to the stage where it is now. Now this would have had three important effects, and, and I mentioned them earlier. First of all, it would have reduced the fractionalization of the opposition force, uh, which has progressed over the, the, uh, the timeline of this war. There would have been fewer players on the opposition side, which might have led to uh, more enduring stability potential after conflict. Secondly, it would have prevented the Assad regime from its authoritarian consolidation, in which it took influence from many external actors who assisted him in making his authoritarian technology more robust, improving his capabilities against his own population. Third, it would have removed some of the external players, uh, such as Russia, from exerting stronger influence over the situation, uh, not necessarily uh, in alignment with U.S. objectives, uh, as they've done over the last year. So, uh, in conclusion, again, these were just four thought problems where we might have acted against this system or influenced this system over a period of time that would have altered the path uh, which has brought us to where we are today, which is, which is somewhat of an impasse. Uh, at this time, I'm going to open it up for the, the rest of the group to offer any including remarks or comments you have. We covered all? We did. Okay. John, thanks for having us out today. <laughs>